Okay. All right, thank you all again for joining us. Um, so C. Grimaldus Gallery is the longest continually operating gallery in Baltimore. We opened in 1977 with a focus on local and regional artists, encouraging a spirit of exploration and experimentation. Within just a few years, owner Constantine Grimaldus began to exhibit more important international artists, beginning with Grace Hardigan, Elaine de Kooning, Alice Neal, Anne Truitt, and Sir Anthony Caro. The gallery maintained its commitment to emerging and mid-career artists while simultaneously developing relationships with many of the major names of the day, including John Baldessari, Willem de Kooning, Robert Rauschenberg, Richard Serra, Joel Shapiro, and John Waters. Focusing on a selective roster, the gallery promoted younger artists like Chul Hunan, Beverly McKeever, J. Coe, and John Rupert, exhibiting their work along with more well-known artists in both regular gallery programming and at international art fairs in the U United States and Europe. And of course, the reason why we're here today at this talk, um, currently on view at C. Grimaldus Gallery, is Greener Deal, a solo exhibition of works by Hidenori Ishii. Raised in Yowenzawa, Japan, Ishii creates painting and paintings and prints that investigate personal narratives, environmental science, and global politics. Through the use of floral patterns and post-atomic materials, the artist creates connections between developing technology and the natural world. So thank you, Hidenori, so much for sharing your amazing paintings with our gallery um, and with our patrons and for being with us here this evening. Um, and lastly, I'd like to take a moment to introduce and extend a big thank you to our visiting moderator, moderator Miriam Erdeli. Miriam is a art advisor and appraiser based in New York, specializing in modern, post-war, and contemporary art. Miriam is currently the executive assistant at Contemporary Art Partners, which is a private um, art collection operated by a group of collectors involved in the acquisitions and sales of contemporary art. She is also associate of the FST Studio Projects Fund created by the late art dealer and collector Federico Taylor, who helped artists fund their studio rents in order to support local studio practices in New York City. She earned her BFA in interdisciplinary arts from Concordia University and notable experience include working at Casey Kaplan Gallery and Office Insiders, um, an art advising and appraising firm servicing clients from America and Europe. Uh, passionate about art and art business, Miriam is dedicated to offering collectors excellent assistance in the creation and management of their art collections. So thank you so much, Miriam, for being with us today. Um, I'm really excited to um, hear you talk with Hidenori about his work. Um, so what we're going to do is start with a brief introduction to the exhibition um, and into Hidenori's work. And then we'll move to a guided conversation with Miriam, after which there will be time for audience questions. Um, viewers are welcome to post their questions in the chat along the way, um, and I'll address them at the end of the conversation or wherever they feel most pertinent. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Hidenori to give us um, a little introduction to his work. Great. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Um, my name is Hidenori, and uh, thanks for the int great introduction, Julia. And again, like I really appreciate this like moment um, and this opportunity for Grimaldus Gallery and Costa. Grimaldus, who is the owner of this gallery. And I've been working with him like about almost like 16 years, I think. So I've always, you know, thankful for him and all the support he's been giving me. And this is actually my fourth solo show with the gallery. And uh, it's just kind of fascinating to be able to have a full like in-person exhibitions uh, around this time. It's been only like a year since this whole, you know, global pandemic, but being able to have actual works in the gallery space just kind of like really quickly is actually very uh, fortunate for me. So really 
I really appreciate for making this happen. And uh, um, this show, Green Ordeal, is actually uh, including works from in the past, sort of like the oldest work I have in the show is like dated back in like 2015. And most of the works in front of the galleries are kind of fresh paintings that I've been building during this like pandemic time. And also I have like some new print works that is on paper uh, that I made during this uh, artist residencies in the Lower East Side in 2020 in summer to uh, March 2021. And um, the image right now uh, up on the monitor is uh, one of the uh, on the fence uh, still life better series from this year and uh, this like on the fence series started out as kind of like response to or the more likely the uh, continuations of like my uh, other group of work called like nostalgia series which dated back in like 2015 and I've already made like multiple of them but um, this on the fence series really like started out as the kind of like continuations of that like nostalgia, nostalgia series in Ice Plant group of work, which Ice Plants kind of like dated back into a sort of like my direct response to uh, Fukushima Daiichi sort of nuclear uh, accident. And then uh, I visited the sites a couple of times, just kind of like overseeing like the actual like, like landscapes and scenes and sort of like personal space of like people's like in evacuated zones. And uh, I started creating this whole series uh, since like 2012. And this is kind of like these groups are kind of like my reflection of like nuclear contaminations and sort of invisible fears and how that is kind of creating the uh, geological and psychological sort of like separations and uh, and uh, this series has been kind of going over years but uh, I've been using that as kind of like a, a series to kind of further investigate the uh, ever developing like urban landscape that is kind of like within this context of like sort of invisible fears and contaminations and or embedded traumas of like political and social sort of like uh, systems that we live in. Um, that is kind of like the close up of the uh, on the fence series, but uh, it is actually kind of like challenging to see from like image on the monitor, like how uh, each individual like um, layers and objects that's kind of depicted within the paintings uh, to be visible like through this, but uh, it's a little bit more uh, experimental. I mean, not experimental, but experience oriented in the sense where if you actually stand in front of those paintings, I think people real like react a little bit more uh, uh, with the senses than sort of actual image itself. And I think that's kind of one of my concerns about like my paintings in this series. And like the, this like on the fence, like specifically, can you actually sort of go back to maybe like on the fence, I'm gonna, uh, like these like series actually like started out like sort of as my response to sort of like New York, like urban like landscaping as well. And that these are kind of like uh, direct, well not direct, but these are like derived from like the presence of like green construction walls in New York City. And uh, that is kind of like, to me, like sort of like uh, a good like symbol or like a symbol for myself, uh, just because I've been like sort of investigating sort of like how that transformation of the space, like landscaping, like landscaping and how environment impact sort of like being affected the like space we live in throughout my uh, career. And then uh, within that sort of context of like New York City, that's where like distractions and constructions happen at the same time. And uh, that law itself has a like, kind of like actual functions of like divider as like divider and separations of space. But at the same time, it comes like down at some point. So, uh, and also to me, like the green color itself is very symbolic as 
I'm going to talk maybe a little bit more later, but um, this substance I've been using for my. Uh, this like substance I've been using for my painting. It's called like Precourt C72, which is like neon green like substance, which was actually sprayed over uh, in the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear site uh, right after the uh, nuclear meltdown happened, and uh, which substance was like used to like seal those like radiations down on the grounds or the surface so that like there's no air, uh, high radioactive like air doesn't come off into the sky, you know, to be carried over to the other wider regions in the area. So to me, like, there's like a one picture that really struck to me as like a point of discovery where like, it, it was like a really like lightning moments, this image of like green sort of color sprayed over this industrial like uh, uh, building, which is already almost like shattered, you know, uh, explode it. Uh, that kind of linked to sort of my like a bit memories of uh, just like seeing from actually this is when I was in Baltimore back in days like 2013, I mean sorry 2003, 2004, I was in Baltimore for like grad school and I was driving I think it's like on like I-695 like this like highway near Baltimore and I saw this like uh, a scene where it's like land development site with all those like dust in like um, kind of brown, like reds, like sort of like dust. But I've seen this kind of green sort of like paint covered over on those like red sand, which later on I was driving. So and again, back, back in the days, I didn't have any iPhone, so I didn't I wasn't able to like check what it was. But I went to like sort of back to my home, look it up, what it was. It, it was actually some very similar, like very industrial sort of like landscape, like developing wise kind of temporary like resin that is being used to keep all those dust or from like blown wind uh, or just kind of like visually make that sort of temporary like scene as kind of like a green like landscape. So to me, that was kind of the moment of like, sort of like um, that I decided to just kind of use, stick with this like material for the rest of like this kind of group. And again, like in that sense, I think that uh, the original use of Creek Board also kind of like align with the uh, sort of like similar way to the this kind of like green construction wall in New York City. It's kind of temporary, sort of comes down at some point. Um, but at the same time, the beauty of it, I think these like our green construction wall in New York City is kind of like cultural hubs that's kind of being used for uh, graffitis or street artists are kind of like really spraying on graffitis and there's much of like fashion kind of a cultural sort of Bolton boards kind of paste over, tear down. There's a lot of activities within the sort of like livings uh, in the city. And I think to me, it's kind of very like democratic and like sort of like as its own presence. Um, but the, yeah, the series was kind of started as kind of my response to sort of like Trump's like border wall policies as I was getting green card back in days, like in late uh, 2016 and early 2017. And, uh, as for myself, as like a uh, following workers, I think that sort of uh, questions and anxieties and sort of like hopefulness was embedded within that sort of like wall series on the on the fence series. And I also did this uh, 24 feet across installation element sort of painting uh, in 2019. And that's really has a kind of like a little bit more of like wall presence than uh, these guys. But um, anyway, I probably I'm talking too much about like two details about these guys. So like, I'm going to move on to like those like mirror series a little bit. But um, I um, so yeah, like these kind of mirror series really started out as kind of like extensions of like what to, you know, how I can sort of like make object or paintings. That is the uh, notions of like self-contained, invisible, 
invisibility and using extending that uh, use of like screen printing with the Cree court, I was trying to achieve some sort of like capturing this kind of like air, like some sort of like invisible uh, psychological sort of elements with it, with those flower patterns. Um, and to me, like, I think like I had this always like fascination, fascination with the uh, Lichtensteins, like mirror series. And to me, like, I'm just kind of like, bored, like appropriating his mirror series in a sense when it comes to the form and the shapes. Um, but uh, obviously I'm making a little bit more like depth within the work. Um, but what is sort of fascinating to me about his work is the, again, you know, like in long, long histories of the art work, you know, art histories, there are so many painters painted like mirrors and all that stuff within the scenes or uh, as object. But I think what's fascinating to me was like, this is like such a like very simple, like sort of like bottom, like sort of like minimal uh, object or the image I can think of. And uh, um, it's just, uh, you know, simplifying to the point where like originates to the, the form itself and the light depictions of lights and the notion itself and there's like no uh, indications of like reflection itself and what is like missing is sort of like the reflection itself and like the viewer because whenever you walk in front of the mirrors or not um, there's always images of figures that kind of shows in front of mi mirrors but in his work, none of those are apparent. So I just kind of took that whole, this notions of it. And then viewer being invisible, I am sort of like overlaying this idea of like depicting invisibleness into these uh, object slash paintings. And uh, I think some people like kind of like think these more as like a big like camera like lens which kind of like is really great response I got from some people friends artists where uh I think these are kind of like to me like a little bit more like satire to this like whole like selfie culture or whatever sort of like how we perceive ourselves like in modern days through this like lens of like uh, cell phones um I try not to really have like full like uh, reflections of like the viewers onto these paintings. I play with the uh, glossiness and sort of like matte surface of um, surface within the sort of paintings where some area people may a little bit disappear and or appear. Uh, but I think like sort of like looking, I'm really focused on like looking into the object, looking into ourselves by like not actually like looking ourself sort of appearance wise. Um, so this is kind of like function, this functions as kind of object as well. This is a painting from 2016. Again, I mentioned a little bit earlier, it's out of this nostalgia series, uh, taking that uh, idea of, uh, I think when it comes to these guys, I, I always, when I started like these like nostalgia series, uh, <clears throat> I started out as kind of like a response to uh, space-wise. I've been like always like thinking about um, kind of like Monet, Monet's like water lilies, how those are made and are constructed in a sense how like perceptions and reflections and actualities of paintings intervene on the surface which we also like exist in the same space. So obviously like kind of like there's a quite a bit of like, you know, my take on that sort of like um, the modern art histories. And uh, I kind of work with like, what is actually like sort of reflections and not things that are actually visible, but depicted and also the actual presence of like the physical sort of quality. So I kind of try to like capture the layer within these works. And this is the uh, work from, a work from 2015. This is one of the uh, two uh, Black Lake series. And uh, maybe some people can probably like guess the landscape actually 
is kind of coming out of this Japanese maybe painting. It looks like a Japanese old painting back in like 19th century. And it, it is actually sort of, I'm taking again, the compositions of uh, Tani Bunjo's uh, landscape paintings, which is actually kind of depicted near like Fukushima site uh, in 18, 20, 20. And I'm kind of dissecting and sort of a stretching and like playing around with the what a time and sort of like those human sort of activities within the uh, natural setting can probably kind of evolve the landscape painting. And this is the back side of the room. And there's a two group of work I have in, in the back where uh, this like Eki Mook series that I've been doing that I use sort of like very like rusted sort of surface uh, along with kind of a patina painting like finish along with the very like thick uh, heavy paste uh, surface that's covering uh, with some sort of cracks and sort of powders kind of coming out of like the surface. And this comes from actually sort of like uh, my response or I kind of start building this idea during like this Chernobyl trip I made back in like 2016. I stopped by Chernobyl and also I stopped by like Amsterdam and I saw like some sort of exhibitions there. And um, I'm kind of like playing with the, how the um, ornaments or objects or buildings, those things that is kind of like built within the society uh, is kind of left off. And what is like, what, what would like time would it do but these imagery of like flowers are actually taken out of uh, this cabinet maker in Dutch that is like in like 17th century Jan the American. And so sort of that imagery itself doesn't play as much as imagery within the uh, cabinet, but I'm kind of taking it as a point to like stretch sort of a little bit more fictional in the sense that like um, bringing into a little bit more like life quality but taking sort of like more water like hydrations out of like whole system and uh sort of in a way my act of painting is sort of like parallel to what a time would do instead of depicting the um, uh pictorial sense of uh images and um so yeah, you can see like there's some cracks and some sort of pigments sort of like dripping out of the, the surface. And I've, I've done like more than a handful like paintings for this series, but these are the kind of like new ones that I did this year for the show. And lastly, this is the, the, the new kind of prints that I did during uh, uh, artist residency at Lower East Side. And uh, I made a little bit like a still life-ish kind of composition within Photoshop. Uh, I first, I gather images out of like, sort of like stock images from like Adobe stock, uh, sort of choosing sort of proper images that's being actually used uh, in a supermarket, like grocery stores in New York City, or I'm sure like those are stock images. So like you can probably find anywhere kind of very generic sort of like fruits and veggies. And when it comes to like uh, actual like supermarket settings, you see them as like really massive exploded sort of uh, size. And you don't really know the proportions of like who your body as opposed to the image itself. But anyway, like I just kind of like came up to this sort of idea during pandemic when we have a little bit of hard time like accessing to that like daily base sort of vegetables and food wise, get in line for like 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I think I never experienced that in my life. And I don't know, I think it's just kind of to me, that was kind of great opportunity for me to like really compose uh, what are sort of like meaningful of like those like food, veggies and um, fruits, just because I'm also sort of like during like pandemic time, uh, I was taking uh, like uh, bio 
I was kind of like bored, not bored, but like I had a lot of downtime. So like I was taking this like a biohacking class and like just because I've been like very like interested in about like sort of like um, genome editing and like how like the technology like Cas, you know, CRISPR Cas9, that kind of like engineering is actually like sort of happening like during, you know, this time. And uh, uh, interesting enough, like, you know, we talk about more science than ever since pandemic. And uh, I think sort of like that technology is very fast forwarding and like it's really coming down to our daily livings. And definitely, I think that's gonna be like one of like the uh, big conversation when it comes to environmental conservations and sort of how we live in the future. So I was making prints sort of like imagining uh, or like dissecting sort of the idea of like light printing and printing of food or printing of like DNAs and those things kind of like lining like them up like in you know, like one singular like lines and um, kind of playing with it in these prints. Okay. Maybe I'm a little bit over time, but. Well, thank you, Hide. So I wanted to thank you, Julia, for the introduction. And thank you to the C. Uh, Grimaldus Gallery for organizing this artist talk. And actually, this is the perfect image to begin. Um, I think that since I've met you, Hide Nori, I think the main thing about your work, I find, is this usage of the, the, the medium curry coat. And so it's not until I saw this image that I clearly understood what is what is this color that you use throughout a lot of your work and this very neon luminescent um, medium. So I wanted to know, um, and this is a perfect slide, if you could explain what we're seeing right now and also how you found this material and what research led you to it. What is the significance of this medium of curry coat? So yes, thanks for the question. And uh, I think like, I was going a little bit fast, like when I was talking about this, but I first time, yes, this image really like struck me, like when I was like, I was heavily like following the footsteps of, or the aftermath of like uh, nuclear meltdown in Fukushima. I'm from uh, Yonezawa, which is actually right next to Fukushima. Uh, so our parents really uh, took us for, you know, picnic or um, some activities in Fukushima when we were like little. So I have a little bit of more uh, personal like uh, feeling towards that uh, regions and also like whatever's happened like back in days. So um, I was like even like capturing like every like single day uh, webcams of the like destroyed Fukushima died site. And one of the painting I did before is made out of those like multiples of like layers of images. Anyhow, uh, this sort of green substance that I, when I saw this, again, like kind of like triggered back me to the memory of like I, the site I saw like in Baltimore uh, when I was in school, 2003 or four, when I was driving on I-95, I'm gonna I-695 or that, uh, highway and uh, this preserving or keeping sort of uh, contaminations, this was kind of a temporary uh, solutions, but that sort of items that's been actually used to maintain the landscaping for uh, like land development purpose and sort of presence of this kind of like uh, transformations of lands and the sites uh, that kind of like trigger a click me all of a sudden. And then as I start like researching about this of substance, it is like really like, you know, interesting like uh, material, which is actually kind of very close to uh, water based like resin. And uh, I reach out to the company in Japan and I ask them if, uh, if they can like ship it to the US, to my studio, but uh, they were not able to. Um, so what I ended up doing is like asking my parents if they can bring it to me, like sort of like um, 
you know, hidden underneath of like suitcase in this like empty, you know, like soy sauce bottle container, ask them to just kind of pull them into different containers and sort of like sneak them into that custom, which, you know, they did. And I was like, luckily, like I was able to get like uh, one gallons of uh, Creek or which I still like have them. But the great thing about that stuff is like, it's very industrial, like very like uh, sturdy, like in a sense, you know, they've been spraying this like over uh, a door and it really can contain sort of like substance underneath. Uh, so I use this as kind of like the uh, primer for my paintings, like as well as using green as color but most likely I usually like use it to kind of seal the surface of wood panel instead of like applying to the surface like gessos this really sinks down into the uh, structures of uh, wood panel so it's all to me it's kind of like active like sealing uh, when Could it comes to slide six or see that on the fence because I think uh, that that would show maybe the detail of the green mm. yes yep yeah that's a very powerful color I think yeah it's really like interesting in a sense like depending on like how much water I add into and uh, it, the color shifts quite a bit and it is more like stickier than regular acrylic paints. And uh, uh, it has really like strong like holding balance compared to the other acrylic mediums. Really creates a neon glow and a lot of luminescence. Um, I noticed that you refer to On the Fence, this series as still lifes. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know why you're, you're you're using the word still life and maybe if we could look at slide two uh, to show us so yeah i think when it comes to uh still life i mean on the on the fence series that started already like from like 2019 but i started like naming them as the newer ones like still life in the sense i'm kind of like within this square sort of like uh, field, I'm trying to create like new sort of uh, system, like a living system within. And I I mean, maybe some people can like, maybe like see the, uh, the presence of like some veggies and fruits and maybe uh, eggplants or like living organ, you know, sort of like organic activities within there, um, which is kind of like, uh, I, when I paint them, and when I create them, I think about sort of the presence of uh, uh, this like, you know, new technologies or ever evolving, uh, like, you know, genome sort of editing. And uh, again, you know, I think when it comes to like fruits and veggies, I think tomato is more like kind of common and I think people more people probably have a little bit of ideas about like those like gene edited like uh, tomatoes and what those are meaning for uh, and again uh, I was kind of following some like news like a year ago but uh, I think it was like Japan who you know officially opened up this like market for uh, genome edited like tomatoes and fruit and I think none of the other countries I think the U.S. still being questioned but uh, I think there's kind of like interesting sort of conversation we can make about this where uh, you know because we, we don't really know the cause of what's going to bring into our like dietary and like livings um, so I think um, and again, I think I kind of mentioned this like earlier. Uh, these are gonna be the more of the trends for sure, just because of like the conditions like our uh, planets are facing right now, and actually sort of like that 
title comes the the show title Green Ideal comes from that aspect as well. But I think here, uh, I think we are kind of creating almost like to me like this is like a the whole like painting is a kind of living uh, scene where uh, it's almost like living like. I don't know, greens, like salad bowl kind of like activities of food. And, and again, like, you know, every moment as this technology goes forward, I think we are creating new landscapes, uh, which is kind of like, you know, uh, uh, using the notions of like still life, like capturing some sort of like death. And like, you know, again, like uh, I'm mostly like, you know, keen towards a little bit more like a Dutch still life where, which is completely different from none of those back in like 17th centuries, like with the prosperities and sort of like uh, the wide range of uh, uh, trays and uh, exchange and showing sort of like the golden era of uh, exchange powers. Uh, so to me, uh, this kind of like carries that a little bit more aspects than uh, just kind of painting the actual setup of landscape. And uh, I think you mentioned about the use of colors, but I think to me, uh, I'm not really like interested in the depicting the imagery as they are. Uh, I'm more interested in like depicting more of like, like light like the uh, than the like sort of like a luminescent colors than the local colors of object. So I think it comes from maybe both like when it comes to playing with colors, I use like computer to make colors in my paintings or uh, at the same time to me, like those kind of transparent quality of light and the object physics is something that like suggests the progressing of time, the time passage. So um, I'm kind of making that a little bit open, open ended by making them a little bit more transparent and like, like oriented. I love your mention of the Dutch still life and I'd love to go to slide 15 and 17 where um, we see your Eki Mook Ekimok um, series, because um, I thought these were really striking. And then you showed me um, the cabinet um, that inspired this work. Um, it's slide 24. It's really beautiful. Um, so if you could speak maybe a little bit about um, your inspiration. Sure. So yeah, this is also like these images are also from uh, uh, like Chernobyl trip I did like in 2016, I really wanted to grasp what would uh, the image or the like like landscapes and like living to be like after like 30 years, um, just so that I can compare or uh, see what I can come up with out of like Fukushima stuff. And uh, yeah, like it was really striking to see the those abundant objects sort of like interiors and the uh, uh, furnitures, uh, textbooks, and even those uh, uh, you know uh, propaganda paintings painted by the artists, sort of like house painters, which is kind of like um, within that sort of uh, the town Pripyat, which is supposed to be the you know town for the people who is like very like super elite sort of group of people who they made a town for those scientists and the families and I think this that incident happened like right after even like opening so um but anyhow like sort of like the meaning of like the images and paintings within this sort of like um the setting on the right um I think I was kind of questioning about image itself as opposed to like how like the object kind of fades away uh, through the time and decay, like degrees and um, well, I love sort of... the crackling on the image on the left mm -hmm. the room right that was left 
untouched for years um, in an evacuation zone, right? Yeah. And so this beautiful crackling that appears untouched. And so this goes back to directly to the, the title of the work, right? Uh, Ekimak, which is a right. Icelandic phrase. I think, yeah, again, like that one, that, that is one aspect. And also uh, the title comes from uh, a couple like reasons where like I, I love this uh, Icelandic band and like Sigur Ross. And I think to me, like sometimes I name some of my paintings after the songs and this happened to be one of them. And I think it's just, uh, you know, the mood and uh, the pace of the song the music was really like sort of like matching. Um, and again, like if you can go back to the next slides where the cabinet is, um, that the tech cabinet was actually, uh, this is a picture that I took like in the, in uh, Amsterdam, um, the museum, uh, what's the, um, Lick, Lick? Uh, the uh, Ridge Museum, right? Ridge Museum, yeah. Um, and this was not actually the first time I saw like John Van Merican's like cabinet, but there's one at the Met in New York, uh, which is actually the the image that I'm taking from. But I think I was just kind of like imagining this like histories of uh, attributions of like this kind of image of the the object sort of uh, living object, sort of being left out in without touch of like human activities and what the image itself of like flower how that would be actually coming forward or backwards where like you know imagery phase decays as opposed to um like i think i was kind of like trying to um uh, create this scenario for myself within these painting where I am not really painting with that paint itself, but using paint to mimic or create the sort of phenomena instead of depicting. Could we go to slide 16, actually? Um, because what you just said just made me think of, I was actually really struck by the word burnished in the press release. Um, to describe your work. And so I love this word where it really it means to polish by rubbing or to smooth something and to create a patina. And so I'd love for you to describe to us a little bit more on how you create this look where something is almost mm. smoothed out. Just so like yeah, when it comes to these, I, um, I use like regular like wood panels and then I like really like layer so much uh, different values of uh, browns and something those colors that is possibly like the reds that could possibly happen within the natures of uh, like rusting process in the metal like I mean I was kind of like really making it a little bit more of like um, like metal sort of more uh, like a little bit more um, structural like elements of like buildings than the cabinet itself in these work so i create i just lay over so many like layers of colors and just kind of like sand them down and play with the like rubbings and scrubbings and create this like rustic sort of look with along with the the use of that same greens of creek court to create this a little bit more patina like mm -hmm. look um, to sort of insist some sort of like time passage. Uh, and then I go back into the um, kind of pasting process where the uh, crack crackle actually happens afterwards uh, with the, some drips of like pigments, which uh, again, kind of like, I think like, I think some people can really like sort of see the presence of water, like in, in any way, like I don't really, back in the days, yeah, I, I used to paint 
like water itself, but I think it's more of like the presence of water is kind of like uh, significant in my work, including even that sort of uh, like mirror pieces. But in here, I'm like really like doing the opposite where like I'm like really like almost like dehydrating the, the painting itself where you know, which is not going to be the same case when, if I use like oil painting, but I'm using acrylic painting. So I'm still playing with the presence of water in these, just opposite, just kind of like sucking all the water out. Yes, we can clearly see the crackling uh, effect. It's really beautiful. And again, it goes back to these rooms, these evacuated rooms untouched for years, for 30 years. Um, and just, I guess, dehydrating, dehydrating away, I guess, and just being preserved in this kind of non-human kind of environment. Um, um, I would love to go to your print series, actually, and talk a little more about um, how you create these works. Um, this new series, RGB, CMYK, and ACGT, if you could explain what, <laughs> what ACGT yeah. is. I think it's just again, you know, I mean, these are kind of like the prints that I wanted to experiment and, uh, but again, like kind of like I made this prints during residency at a Lower East Side print shop and it was a time still like, the, you know, that kind of high peak of pandemic. And I think, um, the access to the sort of like, you know, like everyday, like living food, I think it's kind of was very like limited I, again, you know, I think like I tend to really just kind of like use those, my experience or like uh, travels or my senses to the drive of like making new work or type of work. But anyway, I think, I think on the press, I think Julia put it like in a really like nice way. Um, I tend to like use the I mean I tend to like embed meaning into the media medium itself so I think printing process wise uh, I did a screen printing here but when it comes to like screen printing you know uh, I'm, obviously you can uh, go as many as colors you want uh, but at the same time I really wanted to play with the uh, like restrictions here limiting myself within very like limited colors, which is simple CMYK printing, uh, which a lot of like printers are actually like doing, but sort of like creating this very almost like, again, I wouldn't say full, but like enough spectrum colors to present or, uh, you know, the image itself uh, that is the sort of printing technique I wanted to go with, along with the compositions I was creating in this Photoshop setting, like on the computer. And I'm like dealing with the uh, like light RGB, like sources, than again, full spectrum colors. Uh, but I think, you know, extending that like sort of like limitations or the coatings of like things that creates multiples of colors or uh, like layers of, you know, things. I think, you know, as I was kind of like also like reading and um, like being fascinated by this whole like, uh, like genome, you know, Cas Casper, like CRISPR, Cas9 kind of stuff, you know, obviously, obviously like I'm just kind of like, you know, I'm not scientists in that field, so I don't know the full spectrum, but just understanding that like we live in that sort of like system, like we, um, and again, like when it comes to like DNA, like molecule, uh, they use this like um, acronym for ACGTs for the uh, like DNA molecules, which creates the proteins for the genes and so, and again, like just kind of like watching some like documentaries and sort of like reading stuff, just like changing like sort of like those like letters to something else could like really mean huge uh, life changer. So I think 
again, you know, computers, uh, all those like little coatings, I think we are kind of filled with a lot of like those like little numbers or coatings and stuff. And uh, I just wanted to kind of like insist that like by putting sort of like very simple shape like circles in the, the silhouette of like circles or like almost like beans or you know like little like things that's kind of like circling out to the combinations of other veg vegetables and fruits which kind of insisting some sort of like new openings for that I think uh our like livings are really like drastically I think changing in a sense so I just kind of wanted to sort of play with that like very a little bit more like I guess I don't know conceptual in a sense so like some areas they are really high high like sort of like dp like uh resolutions as it's almost like made out of like you know small dot like the smallest dot Whereas, like, I'm also kind of exposing some of the uh, very, like, big uh, half tones with the actual sort of CMYK colors. And um, also, you know, I'm using this sort of like chain links that's I've been using for uh, the, the other nostalgia painting as well, sort of like suggesting the links in. I think some people like read it as kind of like a little bit more like, you know, chains for a little bit more biological sort of like DNA and kind of stuff. But um, I'm kind of like insisting some sort of like new living or creatures or new life out of the, these. Well, it's interesting that you're so um, involved in uh, microscopic images and research and um, you, I remember you telling me that when you first came to the United States, you wanted to study environmental science, um, and then you switched over to art. Um, so I wanted to know um, what is the significance of the title of the of the show, the exhibition, Greener Deal. Oh, um, so yeah, I think like again, like sort of like I think pandemic kind of like really. Uh, was kind of very big event, I think, you know, I mean, not only myself, but like entire globes. And uh, I think when it comes to the sort of like new environmental like protocols, you know, uh, um, there's way more, you know, activities and uh, participations like into that sort of environmental activities. And I think at the same time, um, I think we know it's it's a little bit tricky question sometimes as well, you know, because obviously uh, again, sorry, just kind of stepping back a little bit, where uh, obviously that uh, comes from like New Deal, um, which was kind of you know like you know done by. Uh, like Roosevelt and sort of that's a kind of stimulus for some sort of uh you know for the depressions uh, back in the days and again that term was kind of adopted by uh you know these days as kind of green deal or green new deal in a sense for environmental activities and I think that is sort of like to me within this sort of very like you know unsustainable like it's very unstable economic system or the uh, temperature right now, I think we are moving really forward, fast forward for sort of the better environmental solutions again, which involves a lot of uh, uh, new croppings or like engineering sort of like food systems uh, for, you know, the global, uh, climate change um but again i think you know not always i think history has kind of proven that like not always uh the new technology is always the answer so i think at, at the same time i think this is kind of to me like a little bit more questions and also like making sure like we are all like aware of like what's happening and 
in a global term than just kind of what's happening in the US or Japan I'm coming from. But I think, uh, and again, you know, I love, or I'm into, I'm interested in depicting sort of like shifting the landscape, like nature's involved. So uh, I'm kind of like making this, you know, questions, I guess. I remember a beautiful story that you told me about uh, where you grew up. Um, there was this um, island in Tokyo Bay where um, it was a very toxic area um, and that um, you were fascinated by that when you were young about how this island was toxic and nobody could use it and that over time in Japan this and uh, they just started kind of just renewing the space and just turning it back into a park that people could use. Right. Um, so I'm, I've always been fascinated by your, your interest in nature and how nature overtakes. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's kind of like a big impact to me, like as growing up, like in Japan, um, like 80s and 90s, because we back in days in Japan, we had like so much like industrial pollutions and contaminations, even like in Tokyo Bays and like seas in general around. So there's a lot of like, uh, you know, environmental sort of act activists and activities happening. And that's, that's kind of like almost like, yeah, like how I was, uh, you know, very conscious about this environment activities and all environmental issues and all this stuff and came to the States. And, you know, I mean, that was like 2000, well, 1997, and it wasn't really a big deal back in here in the US. Now it's, it's huge. Um, but at the same time, I think to like, just kind of reminded me, your question reminded me of like, this like one last painting I did in, grad school, which is 2004, um, I was following, again, the sort of like a landfill, a landfill in New York City in the Staten Island. It's called like Fresh Kills. And uh, this painting I made like, uh, in like grad school, it was like about maybe 12 feet tall, like really long skinny paintings of like almost like, a, you know, fading towers, made out of boxes and it, that came out of uh, my response to sort of uh, like 9-11 where um, the last like debris they put into that like uh, fresh kill in Staten Islands are those debris from like 9-11 towers I mean World Trade Center debris and then they close landfill and that's kind of like my sort of like response to that and the painting was made out of it but i think yeah i mean again you know it's already been like um 15 60 years since after they close and now i'm already like signed up for the uh um uh, fresh kills like park um newsletters but they're open now as a park as a yeah for people to go yeah uh, on picnics yeah. exactly yeah so i think that's sort of like like aspect of like very like transformations of like uh landscape what's actually containing a little bit more political like social sort of uh, uh debris within that land or like i don't know i think that really kind of interests me where we utilize it for something else and again you know i'm coming from like very like uh like rural filled with like true natures and stuff but i'm also like interested in that sort of like a little bit more like urban uh transformations i think these days now i guess well it's definitely a theme that we see in your work um with the the rep repetitive uh, motif of the flower that you use and the fence and uh, the and just the titles too like landscapes and still lives um, so nature plays a very large part um, should we open it to questions 
Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, thank you both so much for sharing all this amazing information. It's been really enlightening for me who have been sitting with the work in the gallery um, almost every day for the past few weeks. So um, I always enjoy these conversations to see sort of, you know, what else am I not, uh, you know, you know, really thinking about when I'm when I'm in the gallery. Um, so if anybody has a question, please um, go ahead, share it in the chat or speak up. Um, I can get us started. I, I have been thinking about, um, you know, a few things that you both talked about um, in terms of, and I think Miriam really wrapped it up for us here in her last few words, but thinking about, you know, the flowers as um, an intention of nature and then the fence as this sort of like physical man-made structure. Um, but the motifs are all in, in every painting are really bodily. And it's something that I was thinking about um, when sort of uh, constructing the back room in the gallery because, um, you know, we're confronted by um, two, um, you know, seemingly different series, but the motif is what really is bringing them together. And um, and I'm curious because, you know, these are later Ekimu um, paintings, you know, you've been working on this series for a number of years now. Um, and the negative space here um, is so referential of the positive space motifs within the prints. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit more about those organic forms and where they overlap in different series. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. And I, again, like in older uh, Ekimu pieces, I wasn't having that sort of uh, positive image, the shapes of that, like that's present on those prints. But uh, I think in a way, uh, I made those prints first and then I worked on these guys and like in a sense like I think I wanted a little bit of like, I wanted to like inject a little bit of like presence of uh, very like I don't know like a uh, very simple shapes of like organs or uh, like living organs where like I think that actually is sort of like a shapes that's kind of like like a bean shape or like the round circles those uh, are very like simple shapes, but that's been kind of like appearing in my older works multiple times. And again, uh, I think when I was actually making um, those prints in the print shop, one of the other uh, resident artists, I think he really like, you know, was like, oh, but well, you know, like some of them look like a penis. It's like, once I start seeing that, he's like, that's all I see. So I think, you know, there's a little bit of that, like in a sense, very like basic, like shapes of uh, uh, origins of uh, livings. Uh, I try to stick with that in that sense uh, for the shape itself. And I think maybe when it comes to those ekimuk pieces, um, as I was like, talking about like dehydrating and all that stuff, um, I don't know. I think I wanted to maybe bring that like a little bit in there, in a sense, as the presence of uh, human, like presence or like livings. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Is there anybody out in the abyss that wants to um, share a question or thought with? either Hidenore or Miriam? All right, well, I think that was a really beautiful um, sort of deep, deep understanding of your practice. Um, I feel very fortunate to have with me in the gallery so many different series of your work um, to really uh, see them in person. So um, for those of you who are local to Baltimore, um, our exhibition is on view through June 19th. Um, we'll be following that with our summer exhibition, which is a group show um, that's going to feature a number of um, artists, um, as well as an 
special installation by our sculptor, John Rupert. Um, and so that's gonna run us through the summer. Um, so please uh, look out for programming there. Um, again, this talk was recorded. So um, if you want to share it with your friends, it will be posted on our website tomorrow. Um, so thank you again, Keith Murray. Um, and thank you, Miriam. It was lovely working with both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia and Miriam. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Oh, thank you.